Nde wano. Aham bonkem den chiku. I was born on July 4th as the daughter of a self-made millionaire. We lived in the capital city of Enugu in eastern Nigeria. Just like my sisters, I was known as the Adeze, meaning princess. I lived with my father, mother, his three other wives, and my 27 siblings in one big house with a mango tree right in the middle of it. It wasn't easy living in a family with many children from different mothers. My father was the Iwe of Ihe, my hometown. Iwe means king. My last name, Denchuku, was coined by my father from his first name, Dennis, and his family name, Chuku. There's no other family in Africa with a kind of coinage to their family name. Although English is the common language in Nigeria, I spoke in my native language, Igbo, and a version of the Queen's language called Pidgin English. Every Sunday, my mother, my siblings, and me would attend Mass. I always wore one of my beautiful Sunday dresses with my kinky hair and ribbons. <laughs> we had servants that did housework and supervised us when we played outside. Drivers made sure we got to school on time. When I was not using my hands, creating on canvas, capturing my vivid, surreal imaginations, I was either playing soccer with my brothers or hanging out with my friends. I also loved watching my mother cook. My mother was an orphan. She became my father's second wife at 13. Not that she had a choice at the time, but she was hoping to get a measure of education since she was marrying a rich man. But her dream never came true. My mother raised seven children, instilling the best values in us. Her most famous axiom was, don't worry about what someone else is doing or not doing, just do your part and always trust God. Those words forever keep me grounded and close to her. I barely knew my father because he was out of town most times on business. When he was home, his attention was also divided amongst his children and wives and settling of disputes among the villagers. My father made it a family tradition and would send his children to the United States on vacation or to study after high school, all expenses paid for. I wanted to go to the culinary school in the US. Life was easy and happy for me because my father had enough resources to last us a lifetime. Everything changed when he died. I was 12. His entire wealth was willed only to my brothers. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> you see, in the, in the African community, a daughter is believed not to be as important as a son because she will eventually be given away in a marriage. My father's death crushed my dream of coming to America. Instead, I stayed in Nigeria to further my education. At age 20, I left for Lagos, where I attended college and lived with my oldest sister, Franca, and her family. Franca was my idol. She treated me with, like a young woman and not just her baby sister. But not long after my sister returned from a visit with her in-laws, she became very ill. We believed she was poisoned. I stayed home to care for her. But six months later, she died. Living in Lagos without my sister, excuse me, living in Lagos without my sister was very difficult. Her husband did not want me around since I reminded him so much of, my, of his late wife. And the universities in Nigeria were always on strike for long periods of time. I knew I had to fill this void. I knew I had to fill this void of dark emptiness that was about to swallow me. I needed a fresh start. So my brothers invited me to live with them in Oakland, California. They bought my plane ticket. And with my visitor's visa, I arrived at San Francisco International Airport. I was impressed with how big and organized the city was. <laughs> the tall office structures, the undulating streets, the Bay Bridge phenomenon, the wonderful Golden Gate Bridge, 
and the great masses of people with different accents and languages. The passing of the cool, gentle breeze was refreshing. I was happy with the change, but it came at a cost. I felt so lonely. It was hard being separated from everyone and everything that I was familiar with. My brothers registered me at a community college. I enjoyed being in school again, where there were no strikes. <laughs> but our resources were limited. My brothers were students and worked part-time. Most times, we ate once a day. For a special treat, they would take me to an all you can eat Chinese buffet. <laughs> we couldn't afford new clothes for me. <clears throat> so I wore my brother's shirt to school. I was not ashamed because I understood that we didn't have the resources. But a group of students would make mockery of my wardrobe and hair, asking me if I played with animals and lived in the jungle. <clears throat> my unpolished accent was the highlight of their day. They pretended not to understand me when I spoke. I was hurt for a moment. I could have lost control, but instead I forget this group of bullies for the ways they treated me. I understood they didn't know any better. From that moment, they never bothered me. During one of my visits to San Francisco, I saw a white woman <coughs> with her three-year-old daughter this child came to me and gave me her doll. Naturally, I started playing with her. Her giggles got her mother's attention. She came right over, snatched the doll from me, and scolded the little girl, saying, honey, what did I tell you about black people? I was shocked at this woman's audacity. My eyeballs bulged, and my jaw dropped. I had heard so much on television about racism, but never once had I imagined that I would experience this blatant display of racism. It took me some time to let go of that experience. A few months after I arrived in Oakland, my brother, Iman, called an immigration attorney to start the process of adjusting my status for me. Iman explained to me how America is truly a land of opportunity. But I was unlucky dealing with four underhanded immigration attorneys. My first attorney used my case against me to spite my brother. All the others took money from me, sat on my case, and did absolutely nothing to help me. To find inner peace, I forgave them. Dealing with them taught me some life lessons. For almost 20 years, I have been working on becoming a U.S. citizen. While waiting to be naturalized as a U.S. citizen, I earned a degree in computer networking, a master's degree in healthcare administration. However, I discovered my true passion was in fiction writing and producing motion pictures. Finally, I have a credible attorney who is dedicated to making sure that I become a U.S. citizen. Recently, I got in front of an immigration judge for the first time. She's going to hear my case. That gives me new hope. America is indeed a land of opportunity for all. Getting my American passport will give me the freedom to travel around the world and enjoy the benefits of a US citizen. I have wonderful friends and family, and I'm immune to negative people. I've embraced the American culture, but never have I forgotten where I came from. With each sunrise, my faith is renewed. I dream in colors. So no matter how dark the clouds become, I reach beyond them, knowing that the sun will be right there. For me, that's hope. Every season has its time. My story continues, and so does my journey. <laughs>